um, there are some things in the Bible that, uh, you know, they were really popular, and then they kind of went through a time of being really unpopular, and then they kind of gained steam again. And the contact him today is one of those things that has kind of become popular again. And uh, I don't know, it kind of surprises me. I think it's kind of creepy, but <laughs> whatever. So we're going to look at Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 22. Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting in verse 9, and then going through 22. While you guys are turning there, I'm going to fix this. Because it says to do this in the wrong order. The great thing about technology. I think it reached just right. Oh my goodness. Okay. We fixed it. Computers. Okay, anyways, Deuteronomy uh, 18, starting in verse 9. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. Uh, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, and um, because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For those nations which you shall dispossess, listen to those who practice witchcraft and diviners, but as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not uh, hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. This is a reference to the book of Exodus I'm not really important for what we're talking about tonight. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among uh, their countrymen like him, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of them. But the prophet uh, who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. But you say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So just a lot of different stuff. And um, unfortunately, we're really going to have to limit the discussion um, of what we're talking about specifically um, to the, what he's talking about with spiritism and that kind of stuff. Um, so there's just a, a few things. Um, before you before you start um, looking at the Old Testament law, it's important to remember that we are free from the law, so you have to keep that in mind. So, okay. With that being said, there's two kinds of laws recorded in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, these are applicational and principal. Now, this is a very very helpful distinction because when I was in college, they they had this. Um, well, actually, it's more of maybe 40 years ago, they had this system of categorizing all the laws. It was either a moral law, a ceremonial law, or a civil law. But the problem with that format is that multiple laws were in multiple categories. So they landed up with the question of, so do we follow this one or don't we follow this one? And that system completely misses the point because we're free from the law. <laughs> so we don't follow any of the laws. But the law showed truth and it shows morality. So in studying the law, we find out what we do. Even though we're free from the law, we, are, we do still follow it in part. See what I mean? Like, for instance, circumcision. Well, now we're circumcised in our heart. Right? We're not physically, you know. I mean, if you want to, that's fine. But <laughs> see what I'm saying? Does that kind of make sense? Kind of? Am I going too fast? Okay. So these two, these two kinds of laws, applicational and principal. So an applicational law... This is a this is a, a law that is specific to that culture. Okay, for instance, it, it, it's not it's not um, wrong anymore because it meant something else back then. Like for instance, trimming the edges of your beard. This is an applicational law. 
First off, you're, you're free from the law anyway, so you can trim the edges of your beard. But then besides that, this had to do with an occult practice, with the worship of another god. So for then it was wrong, but now we don't worship that god and we don't do it in that way. So it really is kind of irrelevant. Um, however, if once again, if this became once again a worship of another god, then it would be wrong again. Because it's an applicational law, but check it out, applicational laws are based on principle laws. Now, principle laws are moral absolutes. They never change. For instance, right. you should not kill. That's a uh, principle law. That is always true. <laughs> you should not lie. This is, an, this is a principle law. Something that's always true. Now, all principle laws are based on the divine law of love, your God, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's your basis, loving God and loving people. Then on that is, you know, your principal laws, and then on that is your application laws. And I hope this kind of makes sense, okay? So with all that being said, um, application laws are usually only mentioned once or twice, and they usually don't have a reason attached to them. Like, why shouldn't they do that? But principal laws are completely different. They are usually repeated frequently, and there's usually a very specific reason given. For instance, in this passage here that we just read, God gave them a command, and then he gave them a reason why. This command, this specific law is repeated all throughout the Old Testament, and then it's even repeated in the New Testament just in case you missed it, or just in case that you thought that your freedom from the law meant you can do such a terrible thing as contacting the dead. Just in case you thought that your freedom covered that, it doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, applicational laws are based on principle laws. I already said that. Um, what, what's, what's important to note with all of this, what I'm getting at here is what we just read was a principle law, not an application law. It is something that is an absolute moral. Do not do this thing. Okay? Now, I could give you all the reasons why it qualifies as a principle law or application law. I don't want to waste your time, though. Um, so let's just go ahead to the passage itself here. Now, at first, it kind of seems like these are two unrelated parts. So there's, you know, there's 9 through 14 where it says, you know, don't, don't get involved with witchcraft and all this stuff. And you're like, okay, that's not, that makes sense. And then you get down to verse 15, and it sounds like he switches the topic entirely. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. What are you talking about, God? We're talking about how we shouldn't do what? Well, in those days, the reason for contacting the dead was usually some form of manipulating the gods or, you know, finding out the future or that kind of stuff. So it really does apply to, hey, instead of contacting the dead, I will speak to you. Now, who is this prophet that Moses promised? It's Jesus. Now, I could go through all the different ways that Jesus qualifies as that prophet, but once again, it's a little bit of a rabbit trail. So these activities were associated with contact, um, contacting or manipulating the gods, um, which obviously uh, kind of goes back to the Ten Commandments, kind of a no-no. Um, what if the contact of the dead isn't to tell the future, but only to see the lost loved ones again? You see this very, very often. Okay, God, I understand your reasoning, but here's my what if. Um, a good example of this exact same thing happening is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You might know him as the one who wrote Sherlock Holmes, uh, The Lost World. Um, in his later years, he lost a bunch of family in World War I, and so he turned to spiritism and uh, started going to seances and different things like that. Now, obviously, I'm not condoning that, but he is left as a phenomenally good record of this. What I mean by that is it's a scientific um, walk through seances. Which proves one important point that I want to get, get across. That contacting the dead is not just something of illusion. It is something that actually happens. Okay? This is a very important point that I want to make because we're going to build on that. Now, I'm not going to say that when you contact the dead, you're actually contacting your loved ones. We'll get to that in just a second. But the, the takeaway I want you to get from this is that there is proof that this kind of stuff is more than just smoke and mirrors. Um, so let's look at that question. What if the contacting of the dead isn't to tell the future? Okay, I, I, I promise God I won't ask them anything to do with the future. I will just go and see my son one more time. This is a very appetizing appeal for many people who have lost loved ones that they very greatly miss. Very greatly miss. And so let's look at that. First off, uh, it is once again war war uh, warned against throughout the whole Old Testament and New Testament. And uh, this is not based off the law, but it's based off of God's standard of morality. 
of what is right and wrong eternally. It's separate from the law. There was right and wrong before the law was ever given. So when the law was given, God just simply revealed to them this moral absolute truth. Do not contact the dead. Now, uh, it's important to reference that a lot of the different things, he just says, don't do this, don't do this. But he specifically goes out of his way to say that this is detestable. Um, something that is just uh, repugnant to the Lord. Kind of like, um, you know, when you have babies in the house and you have a bunch of dirty diapers and you go to take out the trash. You know that, that like, the, the diapers have been sitting in there for a couple of days and you get a whiff of it and you kind of, whoa, wow. Should have taken this out yesterday. You know what I mean? That's kind of the idea here. It's detestable to God. And he hates it. And uh, it's important when God goes out of his way to say that he hates something, just stop and listen to what he's talking about. Probably... A really good place to start. Um, also, it specifically men mentions that in doing this thing, this contacting of the dead, this witchcraft, all this different stuff, he specifically says that it makes the person not no longer blameless. Look at this. When you enter the land, okay, don't do these detestable things. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes a son or his daughter. He goes through the list. But then in verse 12, for whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, okay? And because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. Verse 13, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. If you do these things, you will not be blameless. So this is kind of a big point because God addresses this thing from like seven different angles to make sure you understand this is a bad thing to do. So with that much warning, you kind of have to ask, is there some greater hidden danger in this activity that God is so adamantly talking about it? So let's look at that. God often took common practices of the day and gave them special significance for Israel. For instance, sacrificing animals. This was not something Israel came up with. This was done for hundreds of years, thousands of years before Israel. The law. Uh, there were laws written long before Israel ever got the law. The tabernacle. Did you know that the, the tabernacle wasn't even original? It was borrowed from the Israel's neighbors. I mean, a lot of other people. Archaeology shows us that. The Holy of Holies, that was a borrowed idea. What made... Israel's tabernacle significant is that there was no idol in the Holy of Holies. That was the big de defining distinction. Why was there no idol in the Holy of Holies? See, that was the point. All these laws, you know, the law doesn't even cover all the laws that they followed in, in, in that Israel itself followed. It had, there were other laws that Israel followed that aren't even in the laws. So why did God bother to give the laws? See, I mean, all these different things, God took them and he reused them to teach Israel very valuable lessons. But, with all that being said, he never once uses witchcraft or anything like that and turns it in for his own purpose. Never anywhere in the law does he borrow the idea of witchcraft or sorcery or divination. He never once says, take, take the animal's entrails and examine the liver. He never says that. He, he never gives them a list of, now, if you see this sign in the heaven, that means this. If you, you should see the Babylonian archives. Guys, they had, they had compiled over hundreds of years all the different signs and what they meant. If a bird did this on this day, if this did this, if there was this spot on the liver. I mean, they had the very extensive, uh, very extensive records. They, they were great uh, astrologers. They had great lists of, of different uh, signs in the heaven and what it could possibly mean, uh, forecast and whatnot. You never see God use those things in the law. That's a very important point. So the first obvious reason from all this why we shouldn't do it is that God hates it. Even if we're doing it for our own reasons, God still hates it. He went out of his way to say that, I hate this. <laughs> I think that it's kind of important, especially since he had the New Testament writers once again mention it again after Jesus had already come. Just in case. <laughs> so, uh, a few other things. It's dangerous. The reason why it's dangerous is because it takes you into contact with things you weren't meant to contact. It's not a way that God wants you to live. And then he verifies this by in verse 15 when it says, I will raise it for your profit. I didn't tell you to contact the dead. You contact me. See, there's a difference there. God's trying to shift their focus. These, what do you do when you, miss, when you miss someone who you've lost and you just, you just wish you could see them one more time? You turn to God. You go to God. They're gone. They're gone. That sucks, but they're gone. You trying to conjure up their spirit again is getting you into a world of hurt. It's not going to affect them. They're already gone. 
Um, see, in the Bible, God, God gave his designs for what things were meant for. Um, for instance, uh, marriage. Um, I don't want to get sidetracked on a discussion that is not a benefit. But I believe that things are wrong not based off of what my personal feeling on them is. I believe that they're wrong with what the Bible says. That's, that's the standard of, of truth. And anything that doesn't meet God's initial design of marriage, I don't believe in. That's why I don't believe in multiple wives. I don't believe in multiple wives, not because nobody else is doing it. I don't care who else does it. I don't believe in it because when God designed marriage, he said one woman and one man. That tells me that no matter what I think I need, I don't need it. I don't believe in relationships with minors because, not because everybody else doesn't believe in it. I don't care what everybody else believes in. I don't because God created one man and one woman. He didn't create a man and a child. See what I mean? I, that's what you base that off of. So with that being said, God didn't design us for the contact of the dead. And he didn't design death to be intermingled like that. Look throughout the entire Bible and you'll see the same theme. Death is a crushing thing, but through Jesus, there's freedom from, from, the, from death. Amen. That's why he says, now death wears your sting. In other words, death does have a sting. But now with Jesus, death has no sting. See, there's a big difference there. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to circumnavigate their pain by breaking God's laws. And that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. And it doesn't work today either. Also, God doesn't want us hoping in this. God doesn't want us hoping in, in, in temporary things or in, or in lost loved ones. You know, when, when your loved one dies, if they were right with God, you can know in peace that they are with God in heaven. Amen. See, I don't understand, you know, for instance, the idea of, of karma and rebirth and reincarnation. Because would you really want your dead loved ones to go and have to go through that painful experience again? And again? And again? Oh my gosh, let them, let them be at rest. You know, and, and, yeah. anyways. Um, and so that's another thing is God doesn't want us to hope in this. He, he never once says worry, worry about this or hope in, hope in people or put your faith in humanity or, or all this different stuff. But all over time, he says how we have hope in Christ. Did what? what? Oh. And it says how we should have hope in Christ and how we should put our faith in God. So then that takes us to a story in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12. Verse 23. Now, I'm not going to read this story, so you don't have to turn there. If you don't want to, you can turn to. It's fine. Um, but it's a story of how David has committed um, this, this great, disgusting thing. Okay, this is what happens. First off, David has all kinds of women to have sex with. All kinds. Okay? But instead, he decides to get bored one day. Instead of going and doing work, he's like, eh, I want to take off today. Which is fine. But then he kind of gets bored. So he goes up to the roof of his house, and he's just kind of looking over things. And he's like, hey, what else do I got to do here? And he sees a woman bathing. And rather than doing what a man of integrity should do, not looking and going back in the house, he decides to, hey, we should hook something up here. So he does. And that goes about as good as you'd imagine. Uh, and she gets pregnant. <laughs> you know, there's like a three-day window that a woman can get pregnant per month. It has to be at just this right time under all these certain circumstances, and if she's under stress, it'll affect it. What are the chances? <laughs> what are the chances that, the, I mean, David only committed adultery with her one time that's listed, and that's all it took. <laughs> so, okay, out of all the, you know, three in 30, so one in 10 chance that this is going to happen, it does. And uh, uh, so he's like, well, that's not good. So he calls the husband back from, back from, from war. And tries to fool the guy into sleeping with his wife. But the guy has too much integrity to even have sex with his own wife. I mean, this is just an upstanding guy. He's like, man, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be sitting and enjoying the good life while my other comrades are just out in battle. And here's the thing that, that, that irritates us with this story. It never says whether he, whether the, the woman's husband, whether he whether he su uh, suspected anything or not. Can you imagine what it would have been like for David to be David in that moment? Does he know? Is he refusing to go home because he knows? When you do something wrong, tell me that your guilt doesn't go like that. Tell me it doesn't. <laughs> so you can just imagine David going crazy. 
So he tries to get him to say another day, look, man, go home, have sex with your wife, man. She's hot, I would know. You know, and so then she, he, he does it again. He's just sleeping out on the street. I mean, this, is, this guy is like dedicated. Man, dedicated. So finally, David sends him back, except he sends him with a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, spam mail. <laughs> and uh, the commander is instructed to kind of lead him out to, to die, basically. And that's exactly what happens. He dies in, in, in combat, and it was completely David's fault. So then, after all this happens, you know, David tries to pretend like nothing, like, like it's not a big deal. And uh, God sends a prophet, and he, he basically tells him, no, it really is a, good, it is a big deal. And because of it, um, the child that was conceived actually ends up dying. And this is what David says after the child dies. He says in verse 23, but now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? This is a rhetorical question, and the way it's stated, you can even look back in the original language, the way it's stated, the answer is assumed. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Well, what about seances? I cannot bring him back. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Well, I went to a seance once, and I really saw the person. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's, let's hold on. The thing about seances and different stuff like that, it exalts the dead to the place of God. You understand that? You're seeking a dead person. That's not a good thing to do. We're always told to, to seek after God, not to seek after people. How much more dead people? <laughs> so rather than accepting that God has allowed death and is in control, you know who causes death? God. Every single person that dies, he has decided at that moment that they will die, and there's nothing you can do to change that. If God wants someone dead, they'll die. See, all of us are what's called living on borrowed time. Do you know why that is? It's because in Genesis chapter 3, God said, okay, look, if you eat from this fruit, bad things are going to happen. You're going to die on that very day. God spared their life on that day, but they ended up dying anyways. And then he cut their time shorter and shorter. So now we live an average of 70, I think, for men and 80 for women. I don't remember exactly, but somewhere in there. Um, maybe it's 60 for men and 70. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, moral of the story of being here, that any time that you get on this life is borrowed time. Because we all deserve death because we're all born from Adam and God said that they would die. See what I mean? Are you following the logic here? That means that every moment that you have is borrowed time. God, how could you cause this great travesty to happen? Versus, God, thank you for the time that I did have. Especially when you lose a child or a loved one. Thank you, God, for the time that you did give me. You know, I think back on the story of Ruth. Where, where here's Boaz. She's lost everything. And this stubborn foreigner keeps staying by her. Whatever, it's fine. You know, I'm, I'm lonely anyway. So we'll just both go back to Israel. And then at the end, it shows Boaz, or Ruth, Ruth, um, Naomi just as happy. Sorry, not Boaz. Naomi just as happy as she can be. With a newborn baby, even though all the things that she's lost, instead of focusing on all that stuff, she's just happy to have a child. And I just think that that story is so neat. Anyways, um, so rather than accepting what God has allowed death and is in control, we seek to hold on to a temporary person. That's just not a good thing. So that takes us to the, to the story of 1 Samuel 28, when God broke the rules. So, 1 Samuel 28, there's this king, his name is Saul, he's Israel's first king. Now, he's been king for a while, and he kind of started off good, but something happened in the course of that, and long story short, it just ended poorly. Like, it's almost like he was looking for opportunities to not have a spine. And that really seems to be his problem, is, is, is he's not willing to follow through on the difficult choices, you know. King Ahab, you know, he was a pretty wicked king. I know pastors have been talking about him a lot on Wednesdays. He was a pretty wicked king, you know. But there were some times when, when he almost did the right thing, like with the vineyard, and then his wife talked him into doing something evil. But King Saul, on the other hand, this guy is just like spineless. I mean, it, he gets caught for something red-handed, and he tries to blame it on his, on his soldiers. <laughs> I mean, that's just not really the kind of thing you're looking for in a leader. <laughs> what if a pastor did that every single time something went wrong? Well, my congregation made me do it. Uh, okay, so 1 Samuel 28. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, actually, but long story short, um, 
God isn't talking to Saul. And uh, well, let's start. Let's pick up in verse um, verse three. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had moved from the land those who were mediums and spiritists. Okay, so he did follow the law in that aspect. Okay. So the Philistines gathered together and came and camped in Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel together, and they camped in Gilboa. When Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid, <clears throat> excuse me, afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. Either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets, God just wasn't talking to him. So now we get to verse 7. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who is a medium. Ooh. That I may go, so I'm not listening to God, so God isn't talking to me. So now I'm going to have someone else tell me what God's message is, so that he can just, they can just say what God has already told me. But because I'm being so stubborn, I'm not going to refuse to listen to it, but I'm going to go and find out anyways. And then my means of finding out this message that God has already talked to me about is to go to a medium which God has already told me to get out of the land. Wow. <laughs> you, you really hit the disappointment nail on the head there, Saul. Uh, okay, so... Um, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman who is a medium and indoor. They knew right off the top of their, uh, right off their, off the, the tip of their mind, that there was a medium still that Saul hadn't gotten out of the land. Man, oh man, loyalty, guys, with friends like these. Who needs enemies? <laughs> then Saul disguised himself by putting on other clothes and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, Conjure up for me, please, and bring up for me whom I shall name to you. But the woman said to him, Behold, you know what Saul has done. Now he has cut off those who are mediums and spiritists from the land. Why are you then laying a snare for my life to bring about my death? Now look at this. This is the absolute death, this depth that Saul had, had gone to. Saul bowed to her by the Lord. By the same God who commanded him not to go to spiritists, he swore by that same Lord. If there is such a thing as, if, if, I mean, if, if, if there is nothing else, this for sure is taking the Lord's name in vain, for sure. If anything else isn't, this is. See, oftentimes we think that just saying that is it, but it's, it's a lot bigger than that. Um, okay, so where are we here? Okay, as, uh, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for the same. Commanding protection for someone that God commanded death for. Don't get in the way of what God's trying to do in somebody. Oh, goodness sakes. Then the woman said, Who shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. Now, why would she do that? She's a, she, 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 had, she calls up people all the time, right? Because it was actually really Samuel. Now you could go through the different the different what ifs. Okay, let's let's go through some of them. What if she just pretended to see Samuel? The Bible doesn't say it. She actually saw Samuel. Well, what if it was just a demon pretending to be Samuel? No, it says that it was Samuel. So here we have a little bit of a problem. Okay. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, "Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul." Now. That was a sudden escalation because God intervened. And if you've ever read accounts of seances, it looks something like this. Okay, the people get together, they call up the spirit, and it doesn't really look like a person person. Like it looks like um, the face is like uh, transparent a lot of the times. We're, you know, usually in darker rooms and stuff like that. Um, there is physical contact that happens where, where you can where you can feel and, and, and touch. Um, but there's that, and then also they seem to have the memories. Now this is the part that confuses people. Can demons look, uh, make themselves look like someone and then have knowledge of something? Yes. First off, it already happened. So they, they could have seen it happen, right? From your spirit. Do what? From your spirit. I don't know what you're talking about, but anyways, uh, a demon, you know, if, if, it, if it saw you do something, for instance, see what I mean? Like, let's say, for instance, I am thinking about cheating on my wife, and it's kind of obvious to see when somebody's thinking about that. It's not going to be very hard for a demon to, see what I mean, to kind of see what to tempt me with, because I'm already tempting myself with something that I want. To see what I mean? You kind of get what I'm saying here? So with that being said, it, it's not beyond the realm of possibility for that to happen. And so then that takes us to, okay, 
well, how do you know that, the, that those are actually demons pretending to be someone? Let's come back to that in just a second. Let's shift back to this for a second in 1 Samuel 28. Um, it says very specifically that it really was Samuel and it scared the woman. So whatever was supposed to happen, that was not it. So we can assume a few things just from reading the story and from reading other parts of the Bible. First off, it wasn't supposed to be really Samuel that came forward. That's the first thing that's painfully obvious. Second off, it was not a demon disguised. It was actually Samuel. So that's the, that's the second thing. So then that brings the third thing. What caused this to happen? And after you go through all the possibilities of her or, or demons or Satan or whatever, the only conclusion that makes logical sense is that God, by his power, intervened in this seance. Now, why would God do that? You know, sometimes, sometimes God's merciful... Even when you don't deserve it. Did you know that? He had told Saul all throughout his life. And Saul refused to listen. And so here, his, the, his last gift to Saul before Saul dies is something he knows he's not going to listen to. Yes, you are going to die, Saul. It's not going to go well. Oh, well, you already told me that. But, you know, I was kind of hoping that maybe you would have changed your mind. I didn't change what I'm doing, but maybe you would have changed your mind about what I'm doing. Okay. Well, that's, a, that's an idea. So then, we get a few different things that we're able to piece together. The first off is when you contact the dead, it competes for your faith. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was used to be, well, he's dead now. Before he started getting involved with spiritism, uh, he was a Christian. And then after he got in contact with them, he wasn't. In fact, if you read his books, um, oh, what is the name of that one? He has the Challenger novels. There's a Lost World. Um, <coughs> there's three of them. But in the last <coughs> one, it's basically an argument for why spiritism is good. And in his book, where he actually scientifically recorded all the different events at the same the seances, he goes in there and says about basically how Christians are being um, limited in their in their comfort by you know by not by refusing to have seances. <laughs> so, anyways, you see this happen over and over again. It competes for your faith. Surprise, surprise, when you, when you learn things from demons, it erodes your faith and trust in God. Who would have ever guessed that? I mean, I just didn't say I'm coming. It's like saying, if you do drugs, you're not going to believe in God as much, and you're going to have problems with doubt. Really? I didn't know that. I mean, it's the same thing if you drink. I mean, alcohol is a depressant. It makes you feel like crap. How much are you going to be able to be strong in your faith when you're drunk? You know what I mean? Like, God can't... God can't speak to you if you're, you know, like that. That's why they say so many times in the Bible, be sober-minded. So it competes for your faith. That's, that's kind of a big thing there. It leads to other things that is contact with demons. I could go more into that, but I would like to at this point just recommend a book for you. It's called The Kingdom of the Occult. Not cults. The Kingdom of the Occult. O-C-C-U-L-T. It um, was actually, it was written by... Um, Walter Martin, but he died before it got published. His daughter is the one who published it. But um, if you just look for Martin, the Kingdom of the Culture, you'll be able to find it. And it has a lot of great resources in there. You know, a lot of biblical references um, that you'll be able to look at. Um, it, it's not God's will, and it's not from God. So that's an important point. So let's take that two part. It's not. It's not God's will because He specifically said don't do that. Sometimes we say, God, I want to know Your will, but then when He tells us His will, we don't want to do His will. Okay, so that's not the case in this. We know if God said don't do it. Okay. So it's not God's will. And then the second thing is it's not from God, because how could it be... You see what I'm saying there? Like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to give you this gift that you can't use. <laughs> see what I mean? Like, God, God does things to, to allow for the sake of testing. Like, for instance... Uh, okay, so a choice can't really make exist in a vacuum. Okay? In other words, if, if there's never a chance to do something right, you can't ever actually choose to do something right, can you? Right? Like if you say to your kid, um, go to bed, and then you drag them to, your, to, the, to the bed and you didn't give them a chance to obey or disobey, there really was no chance for them to obey. So God put in the Garden of Eden a tree and offered them the chance, just the same as he allows the possibility of contacting the dead, even though he did not create that. He does not desire that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, it's not acceptable and it's not from God. So that brings a very startling question. So who is it from then? If it's not from God, and we know that all good and perfect things come from the God who is the Father's lights, then who did it come from? See what I mean? And we're left with a startling 
realization. So instead of finding peace in God's word, you chase peace through illusion because that's all that it is. You, you are being fed false truths that make you happy. And how do you know? Well, there's been many documented cases where the, de where the supposed dead person will say things like, hey, Jesus wasn't real. Or uh, Jesus, the, the truth wasn't real. So then you say, well, what if the dead people really do know what's up and we're, we're the ones who are wrong? Well, that would hold weight except that when Christians have gone to these seances and rebuked this supposed dead relative in the name of Jesus to reveal himself, they always reveal themselves as demons with actual names instead of a dead person. Why is that? So you have somebody who doesn't have good belief and good doctrine and doesn't found what they believe on the Bible going to seances, and because a demon spoke to them and told them that they were a dead relative, that they didn't believe it, I, I kind of question where my truth comes from. For instance, Wikipedia, not a very valid source. Uh, there's a lot of psychology things that are really not good sources. So you'll look on who the article was written by. Oh, a house mom who never even finished college, but she knows everything about, you know, um, psychology. Oh, I'm really going to believe that article. Or here's a, here, here's a guy who's got a doctorate's degree but has never interacted with children, and he's going to tell you how to raise your kids. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, stuff like this. Like, are you considering the source? So with that being said, they, they would have some weight to it if it wasn't for the fact that Christians can rebuke these supposed family members by Jesus. That brings the question, if they really are these family members, and how, A, why does Jesus' name have any weight over them? And B, how can they give a different answer when you rebuke them by Jesus? See, I mean, you're left with a bunch of questions that don't add up. The dead supposedly know hidden things, but when Christians command them by the name of Jesus Christ, they reveal themselves to be demons pretending. So, long story short here, stay away, it's forbidden. You know, it's not like one of those things, you know, like, oh, it's a forbidden thing, so that means we should do it and we'll have fun, more fun doing it. No, no, no. You, you haven't seen people who have contacted the dead like I have seen people who have contacted the dead. First off, they live a constant life of bondage. Okay? When, when, you, when, when you play with demons, man, they kind of play back. And it's not good things that happen. And creepy things that happen. Some of the things that I've seen and my friends have seen, and it's just bad things. Bad things. It's not something you really want to go playing around with. So it's kind of important when God says, hey, this is dangerous. Maybe you should say, hey, maybe it is dangerous. Huh. Cool. Like when God said, when you, when you tell your kids, hey, don't touch the oven. It's really hot. And they touch it anyways. And you say, what did I just tell you? You know that it's hot. I wouldn't lie to you. Um, so anyway, stay away from it. So, okay, let's go through a few final things in closing out here. First off, when God tells us to do something, he means it. A lot of us had parents that, that told us one thing, but then we went ahead and did it anyways, and our parents didn't get us in trouble for it. I didn't have that parent, but a lot of people did have that parent. So with that being said, God isn't that parent. God, God isn't that parent. When he says something, I mean, he really means it. And he might not smack your hand right off the bat, but keep doing stupid stuff, and you'd be surprised how much God's not okay with you doing stupid stuff over and over again, especially what's called high-handed sin. That's where God tells you, no, don't do that. And you're like, but I'm going to anyways. That's high-handed. Yeah, have you ever had a super defiant kid that does that? I've got one. <laughs> it didn't take her very long to figure it out. You know, you tell her, Teresa, don't do that. Bad idea. <laughs> oh, oh, it's like, yeah, it's a fire. Golly. Anyways. <laughs> so owning and watching movies such as Ouija, it's a movie about a Ouija board, or even owning a Ouija board, owning music that mocks God or teaches about spirits, attempting to contact a dead loved one, these things are dangerous. Mm -hmm. I can show you actual research that, su that supports what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm not just coming up with things. For instance, um, it, it's, it's been proven that the things that you listen to change your, it changes your, your behavior and, and, your, and your beliefs. If you constantly listen to music that is mocking God, guess what it does to your faith? You can't sit there and listen to someone else curse the same name that you bless and not have any negative effects. You know, you, you hear a lot of a lot of rap music is very popular in this area, and I I don't have a problem with with that. I, you know, whatever whatever you want to listen to. What I have a problem with is the words. I'm hearing these kids walking down, listening to music that's talking about having sex with this woman, and it's like, whoa, you know that your kids are listening to this? Like, this is not a good idea, parents. You know, and then they tell me the things that they're watching. I'm like, ah, oh my goodness. And then
And then they tell me that they have TVs in their bedrooms, and I'm like, ah, ah, bad idea. And then they tell me that they have smartphones and they have computers in their rooms, and I'm like, ah, ah, stop, stop. <laughs> Too many bad decisions all at once, I can't take it. <laughs> yes. uh, unlimited access to the internet, I mean, that's just a terrible idea, and it's been proven that screen time is causing mass depression in our children. It's actually been proven that it's causing uh, intellectual uh, development to, to not go as fast or as much when you let your kids be on, this, be on the internet all the time. It affects their IQ. So we're actually training our kids, get this guys, to be stupider. Our kid, when you say, oh, it's like, it's like this generation's stupid. They actually might be. Statistically, their intelligence is going down. Why? Because of smartphones and TVs. You might, you might think, oh, well, that's, that's kind of outrageous. No, this is what the research is showing. I mean, the, the, it's alarming what we're allowing in our houses. You know, I, 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 I see Christians who have Ouija boards in their house. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, I mean, Ouija boards don't even claim to be contact with dead family members. It, it, it claims to be contact with spirits as a game. That's not a good idea. So now we have all these doctrines of demons that are very common. There's a lot of ghost hunt, ghost uh, uh, shows, you know, where they're supposedly chasing these ghosts. And first off, if you're watching, they're cheesy as can be. I was I was flipping through and I didn't know what it was, or else I wouldn't have even stopped. But I was like, what is this? Because he was looking at a little screen, like, what is going on there? It looked like a little, um, you know, when they're doing graphic design and, and they do the bare outline before they add the add the drawing over it. They just had like these lines. It was like that, and I was like, what is going on? He's like. Man, he's right there. He's hugging you, man. And I was like, what's hugging you? What? What are we talking about? And then he says, hey, bro, come here. And I'm like, whoa, this got creepy. <laughs> anyway, um, your loved ones are not here anymore. So that brings up an, a really big question. Who are you contacting them? So these are things that should bother us. But the problem is when you go through great pain, sometimes you overlook the goodness of something because you are hurting. Pastor and I were talking, sometimes like for instance when you have a physical sickness, you stop seeking after God to use you in things. I didn't think about that because I'm, I'm a kid, but you know, once you've had a couple surgeries, this is something that older people can enlighten you with. Yes, it is true. I remember, I remember when I was hospitalized in 2012, I remember that now. Um, you know, I, well, I, I'm sick, so that gives me an excuse to do nothing and to not see God. And just That's a miserable way to live. And the last thing, when you allow this stuff, you allow problems for your children and yourself, your finances, more addiction. If you're having a problem with addiction, sometimes you just need to look what's in your house. You know, we want to get up whenever we want, not stick to schedules, not be disciplined, live life however we want, have whatever we want in our houses all the time. And then if anybody tells us anything, we get mad at them for it. And then we gossip and backbite, and then our kids are having problems sleeping. We're having problems letting go of addictions. And, well, gee, I wonder why. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. God said, hey, if you do this, I will bless you. If you do this, I will not bless you. I mean, he said it pretty clear. If you read through Deuteronomy, half the book is, is him saying that. If you do this, I will bless you. If you do this, I will not. I mean, for whatever reason, we like to say, pick and choose what we're going to believe and what we're not going to and that's not, not a way that's going to work with God. God wants all of us. See, so we, we worry about, God, I'm not good enough to seek after you, or I messed up again, or whatever. God, God's not really concerned with that. He's concerned with your heart seeking after him. Are you seeking after him? Not are you perfect. Are you seeking after God? That's what we find God really concerned with. Um, so I'm going to close out in prayer. Uh, and then we'll stop the recording uh, after the prayer. God, I, I pray that you just um, speak to us and help us to be wise. Um, help us to not think that we can drink poison and not experience you know, negative results. Help us to, uh, to be wise and, and to go, in you, go to you in prayer and say, Lord, please show us, these, show us if there's anything that I'm doing that, that, that I'm trying to hold on to something that you don't want me to have. And uh, Lord, help us to just trust you with things. And uh, help us to be able to turn to you in our pain, Excuse me. rather than turning to things that we think is going to give us comfort, uh, but in the end just bring us uh, conflict and, and, and disaster. Um, and Lord, we just thank you for everything you're doing in our lives. I pray that you keep speaking to us throughout the week, and uh, help us to see things that we need to get rid of. Uh, amen.
You know, and, and just one more thing, guys. Uh, you know, I'm not one of these people who, who tells you to do something that I'm not myself doing. I have gone through all of my music and got rid of those things. I have gone through all my movies and got rid of those things. I don't watch shows in my house that have all, all this nonsense in it. See what I mean? It, it, it's something that you need to free yourself from. And what we think is we think, oh, I can't live without that. I don't care what it is. Uh, maybe you're binge watching a show on Netflix that you know is not good. Uh, I can give you a couple examples. Number one, Game of Thrones. That was a show that was really popular. That is a filthy, disgusting show. So I tried to read the book to, to make up the difference. Oh my gosh, the, the, the book's just as bad. So I tried to read the graphic novel instead. It's just as bad, except it's got pictures. So it's like picture porn. <laughs> yeah, you know, eh. you know, and uh, what's another one? Um, uh, Black Cells. That was a show that, I, I don't know if it's still on, but it, it was real popular for a while. Black Cells, it was uh, basically the story before... Um, uh, Treasure Island, oh, Cap Captain Flint got started or whatever. Anyways, it had all kinds of nudity in it, so I turned it off and didn't watch it. See, I mean, have integrity, guys. Just because something feels good or you're enjoying a show or you're enjoying music or you're enjoying something doesn't mean that you should hold on to it. Just let it go. If it's causing you, literally causing your spiritual, to the spiritual life to degrade and causing your life to fall to disrepair, just let it go. I mean, your life is so short. Do you really want to waste it on things that don't matter? Yeah. I mean, goodness sakes. Anyways, we'll stop there.